I'm good. And um, I don't know if people have joined in yet or not. So um, to the people who have joined in or people who will be watching it later on, um, welcome to uh, the first ever live chat of Crowdfire. And this is with Sujan Patel. He uh, is a really big man content marketing. And um, I've heard about him. And I've always wanted to work, you know, work out a collab with him. And um, I finally got in uh, to work with Sujan now. And um, I thought it'd be great for you to get your get you know, some call in marketing and social media questions answered by him. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Sujan now, who will um, you know introduce himself, and then I will uh, let's get cracking with the questions. So awesome. over to you, Sujan. Well, thank you for the uh, the warm um, welcome. Super excited yeah. to be on the first one. Always love uh, kicking things off. Um, my background is I've been in the digital marketing space for. Uh, 13 years now. Mm -hmm. I started off as an SEO and naturally kind of progressed into social content and kind of diversified into all things, um, all things marketing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and now I am the co-founder of a content marketing tool called ContentMarketer.io. It helps you with uh, out influencer outreach, helps you find an email address from anybody practically. And I'm also the VP of marketing at a SaaS company called WhenIWork.com. So I do a couple things. Uh, I've, I've written a couple ebooks, and I pretty much leverage content and content marketing to to grow uh, customer base, essentially. Okay, and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about Content Marketer? Yeah, so Content Marketer is a a promotional tool. So what I've found in my years of doing content marketing, I've looked through and talked to so many different people, and everyone's really good at coming up with content and creating content but what they suck at and what most people uh, what the pain point for most people is is that the promotional part the distribution what happens after you come up with the piece of content is the struggle I mean there's a lot of a lot of, um, of a lot of time that should be spent into um, promoting content and, and uh, getting the word out there and that's really what makes or breaks a successful piece of content is how you get it out there and so I wanted to um, initially talk to people about how I do content promotion and how I do outreach and, and how I've become an influencer myself by reaching out to influencers and partnering up and doing things like this, like live, live uh, hangouts. And um, essentially what I found was by what, what Content Marketer does essentially is, and, and I found this out by lots and lots of testing, is that it lets you... Um, reach out to influencers and what I found is if you mention three to five influencers in a blog post mm -hmm. and simply let them know via email or Twitter your your traffic can instantly increase three to five X just by letting them know because they a few of the people will likely share it and I test this thing all the time and not just under your if you're thinking it, you need to be a brand name or an influencer you don't at anybody that can really do that Okay, so you know, since we're talking about content marketing and the fact that people don't know how to uh, distribute their content, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when I started out, it was one of my biggest problems as well. And um, so, I f how would you suggest um, people to measure content marketing? So you know, it's it's like a big thing. So what what would your advice be? Yeah, so I measure content marketing a few ways. I measure in purely traffic, right? That's kind of the top level measurement. Mm -hmm. um, I look at engagement and what I mean by engagement is um, the number of shares that you get per visitor or per, per visit, mm -hmm. um, comments, um, subscriptions to you know an email list or whatnot. Um, so any type of engagement, I c any of those triggers, I consider them one trigger and I look at the ratio of visitors to engagement. Um, I don't always focus, I don't like to focus um, always on traffic because you can get a lot of traffic but not have engagement and at the end of the day for, if, you're, if you're really trying to build something of value you mm -hmm. want the engagement, you want to be able to have a higher impact on lower people so mm -hmm. that's kind of how I look at the traffic and engagement Then the last thing is, is um, leads, right? So mm -hmm. to me a lead could be emails uh, some okay. other people could be signups for uh, a free trial, purchases to a product, what have you. But um, leads and kind of monetization is, is the last part. But 
keep in mind, um, and this is very important, that content marketing takes at least six to 12 months to actually get ramped up. And until you do about 18 months of content marketing, you're not actually at optimal um, efficiency. So don't over-optimize early on. Build the, build the audience, build the network before you actually monetize. So I typically don't monetize or even really get pushy with conversions until or leads until about um, the 12 month range. Wow, so that's like a really long uh, commitment, right? And yep. um, 12 months is a long time. So, um, so Sujan, a lot of our um, you know, Crowdfire users uh, are small business owners. Who um, you know they're just starting out on their businesses. You know they're you know like budding entrepreneurs, or you know they might be budding musicians or writers. And it's usually it's more often than not like a tiny uh, team of like one to three people. So you know if they since content marketing is like you know one of the biggest things out there right now, and uh, they want to start with content marketing, but they cannot hire someone full time, and they're not sure of you know you know waiting till twelve months to see results. So, how would you suggest uh, you know them? You know, what would you tell them to uh, you know start off a content marketing plan? Yeah, yeah. So first and foremost, you know, content marketing has a there's a misconception that it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of resources. Um, it's actually you know it, it doesn't. Um, myself, I'm a uh, you know I have my companies and I have uh, where I work and we have resources. But for my personal blog, this that's just me. Uh, I have en ended up hiring an intern, um, a virtual assistant. Then I ended up hiring an intern locally that mm -hmm. helps me do a lot of the scalable kind of promotion and outreach, and helps me edit my stuff as well as um, transcribe a couple of things I do on audio. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, it doesn't have to be very very expensive. Mm -hmm. So one, you can get content, and the easiest way to get started, you need to build a presence, right? So consistency. I think blogging once or twice a week is enough, but focus on really meaty stuff and have have a different. Uh, so to get the fastest results, you know, I said 12 months. Mm -hmm. That's for when you're going to get optimal results. You're mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing you're going to start seeing returns pretty early. Um, give it give it thir uh, 60 to 90 days before you really start to judge whether it's working or not. But at the end of the day, focus on. Uh, you know, one of five kind of pieces of content. Uh, one that's either you're talking to your ideal customer, mm -hmm. something that's promotional, um, meaning not promotional, promotable, meaning something you can actually promote and get out there. Something that's SEO driven, meaning something that is evergreen. It could rank for something. It could rank for keywords, mm -hmm. and it has keywords in mind. Talking to your ideal customer um, or your current customer. Those are two different uh, pieces. Right, right, right. Um, and when, when, when really the magic happens, when you start combining those, when you come up with a topic that's promotable and then also SEO so that mm -hmm. you can get the word out and you can also, um, what's it called, um, it also ranks and it has long-term benefit. Um, mm -hmm. So you kind of get both. Now, what does promotable mean? There's lots of different ways to promote content. Um, you can, If you have money, which... Let's talk about if you're assuming you don't have much budget. Yeah, because um, they're like small business owners, right? And they're just yeah. managing everything by themselves. Exactly. The, the best way to do is outreach, right? So I use tools like BuzzSumo and then okay. again, my tool, Content Marketer, um, for outreach. So every single post I write, I mention at least three to five people. I also naturally, I try to mention three to five people but I also naturally just include references of articles. Um, I might even pull in quotes for, again from those influencers. Um, and I, everyone I mention on there, I'll let them know I mention them via email or Twitter. That okay. again, that alone is going to help you get really far. Um, I share on social media. I share it on sharing it on social media is like the bare minimum you need to do. The other thing you need to do is join like-minded Slack groups and build your audience so, mm -hmm. uh, or build your community. So right now, um, I'm involved in about 13 or no, actually 14 now Slack groups. Some of them are SaaS focused, B2B SaaS. Some of them are for content marketers. Some of them are for freelance writers. I'm also in a, about a dozen or so um, Facebook groups 
some of them are for personal. Like I love cars, so I'm in a car group of like 500 car fans or car enthusiasts. I'm in one for startups. I'm in a couple for like freelancers and content marketing. So my promotion plan is just just to let them know, hey, I wrote this piece of content. Um, sometimes I invite the people, my network, to guest post on my site. That's another way you can get a lot of you can build your traffic is you get somebody who's already an influencer or somewhat of an influencer mm -hmm. to write on your site. And the the key with that is don't focus on the Neil Patels, the Gary Vaynerchuks, Pat Flynn. Those guys are really busy. In fact, they are trying to back they're trying to always optimize what they're doing to focus on the most value that they get. Right. Get the guys in get the people in between, like one or two layers lower than them that are up and coming. Right? Look at people that are constantly blogging and posting on inbound.org or growthhackers.com and the people that you see uh, or maybe even just ask the people that you're in that community. But the community and either being a part of it or building your own has been very critical to, to my success as a solopreneur kind of launching my own brand. Right. So you mentioned Slack groups, right? So what would, um, uh, how would you, you know, tell people to go about how would they look for the right Slack group? Yeah, so there's um there's a site called Chit Chat okay. chitchats.co. Mm -hmm. Um there's a list of Slack groups there. Okay. Um there go to Product Hunt and try to find Slack groups there too. Um go on inbound.org and start communicating with people. Um if you likely these slack groups are private and they're not publicly available like yeah. most of the ones I'm in are like not you can't just get in mm -hmm. um, you have to even apply to once you find the link so the way I find these is by building relationships with the connected people so um, I blog I mean I comment on most people's blog mm -hmm. um, that I'm a fan of so um, and if it's engaging I'll, I'll try to leave a comment and you know don't just say, oh, awesome post. Say, oh, I love this particular part. Or maybe ask a question or start to build a conversation. And eventually by doing that over and over again, you're going to get connected with the right people and yeah. that you're going to get invited or you're going to get access to these groups. Okay. So, you know, you've spoken a lot right now about, con you know, about influencer marketing, getting, um, you know, shout outs from people and, you know, you know you've told our audience about you know what kind of uh, layer to aim for you know not to go for like a bad fat flynn so now you know the first pitch is super important and that's where a lot of people stumble right and say that you know say they don't have the email address of the person and nowadays a lot of the first a lot of the first pitches happen on twitter you know in 140 mm -hmm. characters so what would you um, you know how would you tell someone to pitch perfectly in 140 characters or less yeah so keep it short Mm -hmm. Obviously, with 140 characters, even email yes. though, keep it super short. Um, most of my pitches I actually do on Twitter as well. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's before you even pitch, make mm -hmm. sure you're on their radar. So do some prep work, and I think um, your software is perfect for that, right? Mm -hmm. Follow them, favorite some of their stuff, retweet some of their stuff, and don't just do this like in the same day. Mm -hmm. Build, like if you plan to connect with somebody December first. Yeah. You know, today is December, you know, uh, November 10th. Yeah. Start now. Get on their radar. Make a list of people you want to contact mm -hmm. and start to build that relationship and start to engage in passive conversation. My rule of thumb is I have to have one, if not two, passive conversations with somebody before I even pitch them something. Then then let's say you do all that. Now you're ready for the 140-character pitch. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, it's not about what you want. It's about what value you can offer to somebody. So the, the pitch, most people go for the kill, meaning they go straight for what they want. They go for straight for what they're asking for right. and the value for them. And frankly, the world is not full of, the world is full of takers, not right. enough givers. And people are busy and, and everyone's asking for something. How about oh. instead of asking, you give something? Uh, maybe it's a recommendation. Maybe it's mm -hmm. just a compliment. Um, or maybe... Um, what I do is I use content and I use the influencer side of things. I use my blogging uh, power to get connections. So if I want something from an influencer, I'll say, hey, I'm writing a blog post on blah, blah, blah. Uh, would you, uh, I'd love for you to contribute. Big fan of your work, especially like 
I'll, I'll, that will be my first tweet, and then the second tweet will say, you know, especially like your article on X, and I'll be very, very specific, um, because even though that whole thing just took me five minutes, you could the person on the other end can tell I'm very thoughtful, mm -hmm. I'm very deliberate, and I'm offering something. It's non-threatening. There's no money. There's no like they don't have to do anything, and they could say no, I'm busy or whatnot. It's a very easy opt out as well. All right, and um, you know that reminds me. So um, of this um, brand, I think uh, not brands. So it's called, it's a tool called Polar, and uh, he will you know they are into creating polls for uh, you know that you can use on Twitter and you can embed polls everywhere. So the story of polls is actually pretty interesting. Where uh, you know the founder actually sent out you know a poll to people and to, you know something that that was related to their own brand. So for example, if um, you know, it, it, you know, he wanted to pitch to say a beauty product, uh, you know, to a beauty page. He, you know, he created a poll like, which is your favorite beauty product, and mm -hmm. that's how he actually got a lot of downloads. So I think that's what you're talking about, like you know, make, like offer something to them instead of just asking, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, um, people also um, like I tweet, and again, if you, I, I do this intentionally to see how people. Um, I've tested it on the receiving end. As, so I do these things intentionally. Every probably couple of days, I add a little bit of personality to my tweets. Um, something personal. Most of them are very business oriented. But sometimes, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm driving my car, and I love cars, so I go on drives in the back roads. Or I'm a big Batman fan, right? So some, every once in a while, I'll tweet something Batman related. So okay. if somebody's really listening, mm -hmm. they're gonna mention Batman or cars, right? Like, uh -huh, yeah. get to know that person on a personal level, like I was just reading um, a post on uh, on Nathan Berry, uh, Pat Flynn did for Nathan Berry, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Nathan Berry owns this site called ConvertKit, okay. and it's an awesome platform for uh, email marketing and marketing automation, um, but essentially um, their conversation when they first started met in person, the first 15 minutes of the conversation was about their family vacations, and I think Nathan must have like researched what you know Platt and like about his family or whatever, but like they resonate on a family level first. So mm -hmm. that same thing hap can happen online. It just has uh -huh. to happen in a in 140 characters, right, or shorter. Okay. Great, thank you, Susan. So I'll get back to my questions in a bit. And there's this question that's come from one of our listeners right now. So I can he want um, okay. I'm just gonna read it out uh, so that people get to know what the question is. And uh, so here it is. So he says that uh, this is Matt Stadden. Okay, I hope I'm seeing your name right. Uh, so he says that he's launching a new brand for toothpaste tags and social media tools like Buffer and Zapier have helped him generate awareness. And what other um, you know tips would you recommend to generate awareness? It's pretty, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So um, you know, to build awareness, it's really. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, I think one is is find kind of like okay. I'm gonna step back a few layers. First, mm -hmm. it's who is actually the person you want to make aware. Like who's your audience, right? Mm -hmm. To figure that out, and then the next thing, once you kind of, you don't have to have the definitive answer. If you say, oh, my audience is bloggers. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Where do bloggers hang out, right? So, you don't actually have to use Lots of a lot of people talk about tools and aware like kind of like complicated flows. But what if bloggers are they're like they're listening to podcasts, right? Maybe um, maybe you just zone in on those podcasts and start sharing those podcasts. Or what if they are actively on a certain community or certain areas um, or in the right like in, in a Facebook group or they're on they're they're talking. All the bloggers always talk and use this one hashtag. Well, maybe you can use um, Cloudfire to like favorite these things and just make you know be on their radar. Um, the um, that that's kind of just one just one way to do it. But really, figure out where your audience and your potential customers are hanging out and just be there. Um, guest posting is a great thing. The other thing is like again, like I want to if my audience is bloggers, I want to be. The, you know, I want to be the authority on bloggers. So how do I become the authority? I can either earn that authority or build it, or I can borrow it, meaning getting guest posts, getting content, and, and getting influence or any type of semi-authorities to write on my site. So 
content is, a, in my opinion, the best way to build authority. All right. Thank you, Sujan. So, um, you know, you're talking about let's 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 get back to content marketing. Um, before um, you know, beginning a content marketing strategy, be it campaign-based, short-term, or you know, maybe it could be a long-term camp, you know, content marketing strategy. What would you tell brands? Uh, you know, what essentials would you tell brands to get down pat before they begin content marketing? Like, what yeah. is the, what's the foundation? So the foundation is really going, and I said this just right now, is is knowing your customer and knowing your potential customer, like what they're, what who they are first of all, right? Like almost like a, a HubSpot does a, a HubSpot has a guide mm -hmm. to help you build a um, a brand uh, or a customer per, uh, persona, but really have like two or three customer personas, and mm -hmm. even if they're really high level, it'll help you understand who they are, and mm -hmm. even if they're wrong, at least you have something, and then figure out what those customer personas, what their pain points are. So then in, with your content marketing, essentially your content can just solve their pain points. Now, if you're thinking, oh, that doesn't really, really relate to my product, but mm -hmm. it does, right? Like, so like look at Dove, right? So Dove, and this is on a very, very big scale. Right. Dove, their audience a lot is more on the, uh, more females. But mm -hmm. their, the way they advertise to females is not, advertising their skincare products is like, you know, I know some of their ads are advertising are like, is, is focused on, um, you know, where the soft, our Dove bars don't make your skin dry or lotion or whatnot, like right. they c directly tackle it, but almost 70% of their, their, their ads and marketing efforts are around relating to women mm -hmm. and they don't have to be sexy to be beautiful, you mm -hmm. don't have to be fit, you know, it's really relating to women's kind of like what everybody, every woman probably thinks about mm -hmm. but not necessarily the sexy part of it, right? So it's like right. almost like their problems and things around what they feel and okay. do the same thing with content. Okay, thank you. Um, so Sujan, um, you know, since the last couple of, um, you know, like months I've been trying to see, uh, you know, what what's new in content marketing, what's what's coming up next and a lot of the sites have been talking about how video is going to be the next big thing in content. So um, what do you think about that and uh, you know how would you tell people to use video for content marketing and you know, do, so you're a blogger right so you like text a lot and what would you know what do you think of this whole shift to video? Yeah I mean um, I think video I do believe video is the next uh, is the next phase, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at like this conversation, you can tell I'm moving. I'm moving my hands. I'm moving back and forth. You can yeah. maybe sense the tone in my voice. I think that's why video is powerful mm -hmm. um, because you can get an understanding of the person behind the behind the kind of the text, right? So mm -hmm. um, how to leverage video? I think. Facebook Live, if you can't get access to Facebook Live, Periscope or Meerkat are both really good. Uh, and then they kind of piggyback off of Twitter. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a great way to, to leverage it. So what I do and what I, I, I'm actually seeing, I've done about, I've done a test probably in the last uh, three months now. Mm -hmm. I've done about 25 videos or so. Mm -hmm. um, Ten have been published, um, more are being published. And I've done uh, about 20 or so Periscope videos. And mm -hmm. I did it in a short burst of time, and it was really a big test to see if I can get the type of engagement, and I would say that, uh, and if I can get the traffic, the engagement, and the reach that my content can do uh, mm -hmm. just with video, and it was extremely successful. Now, I did it, I had no, no presence on YouTube, I have no presence on Periscope until I did these videos, and essentially what I did was a couple things. On my YouTube videos, I took my most popular content, mm -hmm. and I... I, I either broke it down into very simple, shorter videos. So mm -hmm. I took my top 10 articles that I'm, I published this year, and mm -hmm. then I broke them into five-minute segments. So some of them are two, three-minute, uh, or two or three video series, um, and I published them. And I added them to the blog post at the very top, mm -hmm. and I actually got a few hundred views. Uh, and, and again, like a few hundred views doesn't seem like a lot, but I got emails from people saying, Oh, I, I just read your blog post and I watched that video. I love that tip number three. Like, that's spot on. And uh -huh. I referenced different examples in the videos than I did in my blog post. And mm -hmm. most people that commented or um, engaged with me uh 
uh -huh. I actually reference my videos, not my content. So okay. videos gets a lot of engagement, and then Periscope, uh, it's a good way to do burst, short-term bursts. So I would ask randomly on Twitter, "Hey, anyone have a question on content marketing?" And if I get a couple of responses, uh -huh. um, I would just take a question live, and I would address okay. it to one person. And so um, I found video to be a very, very good tool for engagement. Mm -hmm. It humanizes people and it shows people's passion, right? Like uh, anyone can make, if, if you know, I feel like a lot of people can make great content, mm -hmm. but they may not know the content as well. And on video and audio, you can't fake it, right? Like unless yeah. you're a professional actor, you can't yeah. just read content and like, oh, I'm a professional. You know, you're, you're not. You're gonna come across uh, not as authentic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, um, you talked about Periscope right now, and um, you know there's obviously other. And but you said you, know, you did not have a very big uh, presence on YouTube and Periscope until you started out on your tests. And have you experimented with uh, you know um, Wine or Snapchat or Vimeo? And uh, what would you think? What do you think about them as uh, you know potential platforms for content marketing? Yeah, I think um, I. I I've Personally, on a personal brand, I haven't experimented with them, but um, for when I work in other companies, I've definitely mm -hmm. experimented with Instagram, video, um, Vine, VMO. Um, you know, what, what I recommend is if you're talking about a video platform like VMO, yeah. YouTube, mm -hmm. choose one, right? Like just choose one and dominate it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to build an audience on both. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I would choose YouTube. Um, mainly because of the, the the channels, the customizations, and the network, right? Like okay. YouTube is the second biggest search engine. Yeah. That no one can take, no one can replace. Mm -hmm. Um. And and then in regards to like Vine and, and Instagram and kind of the short burst um, videos, right. um, it it getting value from that really depends on your audience. You if you have a very consumer focused audience, mm -hmm. it works really really well. Mm -hmm. But most people I see don't they, they give up too quickly. Uh, if you're gonna devote time to video, you have to do it consistently. With Vine, Instagram, it's typically at least daily. Yeah. Um, and and then keep that pace up. Even Periscope and Mirrorcap, like if you don't do it daily, you 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 have an empty channel, and your audience is gonna kind of go away. So make sure you go if you're gonna commit to video. Commit to like 90 days, five days a week. Oh man, that's a lot of commitment, and it's uh, a big commitment, it's right? It's a big commitment because you, you know, like video, um, it seems pretty easy, like you know, it's just a photograph or it's just like a click, or you know, it's a Snapchat picture. But there's so much thought that goes behind, uh, you know, every little picture, the placement of you know a certain pen that's you know just strewn about supposedly yeah. randomly or like the lighting and the photography. So there's a lot of effort that goes behind it. And of course when you talk about video, there's there's like the whole videography and need to know how to, you know, there's the software, video editing software are really expensive. So it's a big commitment of course, but uh, you know, it does pay off, right? Of course. Yep, it, it does. And and one thing I noticed is that most people don't, they half-ass video. They, if you're going to do video, mm -hmm. make it Get the cheapest setup that makes you look professional. So yeah. I don't know if you can tell, but I have I don't have lights on now, uh -huh. but I have a small studio. It cost me about two hundred fifty dollars. Okay. Uh, just a light here, here, mm -hmm. and a light behind me, lower kind of right on my lower back, and they oh, both okay. in my face. So the lighting is really key, and I just have a little cheapo iPhone stand that like puts the phone. Uh, my I use my phone. I use I have an iPhone oh, really? six. Okay. So like, you don't have to have a really expensive setup, uh -huh. and I just have a little tripod that goes in front of me. As long as you have your lighting right, and then you can use a white wall, mm -hmm. and that's that's fine. But like, those little things make a big mm -hmm. difference. And mm -hmm. although like, although video is you know it's a little more work, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, making a great blog post, you have to design images, you have to kind of you know you you, you have to polish that as well. It's just different type of work. Mm -hmm. The one big benefit of video that know why I love it so much and mm -hmm. why I'm going to be doubling down or tripling down mm -hmm. on video into 2016 is that um, the value you get from video, when you make a video, not anyone can make a video, right? So um, 
if you get in, well, one, it's kind of early again, so you can get in early uh, and be, you know, kind of dominate before everybody goes and does it. But the second thing is that um, when I make a video and I record a topic on, let's say, 10 ways to, you know, like 10 growth hacks or presentations I do for public speaking, right. I'll do those same things on video. Mm. Now, not everybody can get invited to public speak and speak at conferences or go to events and things like that. So video is one way to demonstrate your authority, mm -hmm. your knowledge in that space or topic mm -hmm. um, without having to go and go to that next level and get invited. Meaning like if I post a video that I did that the same topic I did on a, on a, on a, at a conference I spoke at, mm -hmm. My video will be almost as valuable as my conference talk. Now, okay, the next yeah. thing you need to tackle is the is the promotion, right? But like, mm -hmm. the level of credibility you get is there. And if you're thinking like, oh, how do I produce this? Mm -hmm. If you have a Mac, use iMovie. It like mm -hmm. I, I, I did most of my videos in the beginning myself. Yeah, I always do. Yep, and you can use um, what is it called? Um, I do recommend adding a professional intro and outro. You uh -huh. could probably get one for about $500, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little more. Um, and uh, I, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but if, if um, I could add it to the notes later or if you want to tweet at me, I'll send you a link to it. Okay, sure. Great. Um, so, you know, you talked about right now, you know, we just, were just talking about how we need to be really consistent with video, you know, possibly post every day and we'll put out a video every day. So not, one of the biggest problems of content marketing is obviously the glut of it. Like there's so there's so much content out there, and there's mm. millions of blog posts that are being posted out every day. There's millions of videos, and um, you know a lot of people still struggle. You know they they, they put out great con content. They, they're very consistent with it, but still a lot of us struggle with uh, getting the right viewership over here. So two questions for you: A, how would you suggest uh, you know people get their content noticed? And secondly, what do you think is more important? Getting more eyeballs or, you know, you can get a, a small number of eyeballs, but, you know, it's relevant <coughs> eyeballs. So what would you say to these two questions? Um, I think, you know, to answer question number two first, um, mm -hmm. it's, it, don't, don't focus on the, the number of visitors. Focus on the engagement you get. I'd, okay. rather, I'd rather have 100 people to my website every day that's mm -hmm. very engaged, that's, talking to me and commenting on my blog posts and, and kind of sharing and, and again, engaging, right, right. than I would at 10,000 because okay. I made a bigger impact on 100 people. And it sounds small, right, but like 100 people, that's, that's a lot. It's enough yeah. to, um, if you wanted to start a software, like let's say you start a, a, you write an ebook or write a book mm -hmm. and you had a really big influence of 100 people, you could probably get 40, 50 sales. Okay. Um, with a thousand, if you had a thousand people or even five thousand visitors to a site, mm -hmm. um, with less influence, you would, might not even get fifty sales. So think about it that way, right? Like you have a, you know, just a. a I, I focus on influence and engagement more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And then how you mentioned how, I, I think it's so. So so many so many people focus on quantity. I feel like people are creating content for the sake of creating content. And yeah. sometimes I fall in that, and I think everybody falls in that rut or like that kind of like grind every day. But mm -hmm. back up, like if you look at like Brian Dean from Backlinko, the mm -hmm. guy creates like one post a month, if that, right? And But it's really, really thought out. It's really big. And he puts all his weight behind promoting it and getting it out there. Now, yeah. it's not necessarily the how, it's the process I'm talking about, right? So if you had known nothing about blogging or writing content or content marketing and you just put one month, you only produce one content and you put all you, all the energy you have behind promoting it, yeah. I guarantee you you're going to get better results. So I think my advice is back off the throttle on creating the amount of content and focus on creating the real quality content because you look at most sites, and I've analyzed you know sites like like Quick Sprout and um, a lot of the big you know big content marketing players or pe people that are doing content marketing really well, mm -hmm. and a lot of their traffic comes from on a monthly basis evergreen content. What does that tell you? It's not new content that's 
the their their bread and butter. It's actually all the content they created in the past uh -huh. that was so okay. quality. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. And um, you know, you actually reminded me of uh, when you were talking about uh, you know creating lesser content but quality content. It really reminded me of one of my favorite uh, websites, my favorite blogs, Wait But Why. And uh, Tim Urban's like such a genius, and he only creates like one blog or you know one post a month, but it's a yeah. really thought out forty thousand word article, and it's it's an amazing read. So that was great. And uh, you know, talking about getting eyeballs, uh, let's move on to talk about distributing it on social media. So, Sujan, you have about you know eighteen to twenty thousand followers on Twitter, and have you um, you know have you done any uh, Twitter growth hacks, or you know do you you know do you know of any growth hacks that you could share with our audience and what they could possibly do to build a strong community on Twitter? Or yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. So one of the things I do, uh, and I've, I've just kind of mastered it recently, is that, uh, well, one, I do a lot to build yeah. my Twitter following. Um, a lot of it's just sharing good content. Yeah. Um, I use the right hashtag. So I found all the hashtags. Uh, and I made a list at the beginning of the year of like, all the hashtags, and I just do this every, um, every six months or so. Okay. Uh, and I make sure everything I share has some hashtags to it. Okay. And not everything I share in the sense of everything that's on my buffer feed, but it's everything I manually share. So oh. I have my buffer feed that shares like 60% of my content, and then I have right. the 40% is like live as I read it or as I actually consume it. And those content, I always try to add the right hashtag. So okay. that alone has got me, in the, got me more followers and build a presence. My growth hack, though, is... Um, Find all the top conferences or events in your industry or even in your area and participate. So just make it and add it on your calendar of when yeah. you're... You don't actually have to go there, right? You just have to participate in those conversations okay. and start follow all the people that are at the event because I guarantee you the people that are at an event lot, like tweeting stuff, they're very active on social media and they're going to get... They're going to become... They're going to engage with you somehow. So just follow them, tweet, retweet some of their stuff. Even like, oh, that's an awesome presentation, um, you know, whatever. And even more than that, you can actually get a lot of these like really good um, slides for these con uh, conferences without actually having to attend. So I have a list of the all of 2000, the rest of the years and 2016 conferences. I guessed all their hashtags that they're going to use, and <laughs> no I have, way. I added them all. Okay. To um, uh, my list of things to follow, and I use, um, you know, your software essentially to add all those tools and and kind of at least start the conversation and engage with them. So easy hack to get really really high, short period of time, really high burst. Okay, great. So um, you know, right now you spoke about you know like talking of you know going you know looking up conferences and. Uh, following and engaging with uh, people, you know, who are tweeting about these conferences, and um, I know that a lot of times, uh, you know, on social media, uh, you know, the follow for follow or you know the give and take is, you know, some people are a little squeamish about that approach, and you know, they'd rather have everything organic. Um, so I wanted to ask you what your thoughts on that were, but uh, like you know, I just like, there's this, uh, you know, there's this user story that I'm working on right now, and you know the uh, the user, uh, she actually told me a very fun way, uh, a very different perspective rather, of looking at the follow for followers. So uh, actually I actually wanted to share it with you and uh, ask you what you thought, and also with our audience. So she said that, uh, you know, you, sh you shouldn't be too squeamish about follow for follow because it's like, you know, imagine Twitter is like just one big party and you want to go network at the party, so you don't just stand in one corner and say interesting things to yourself. Like you go and introduce yourself, like, hey, hi, I'm Shreeja and uh, you know I've, I've read a lot about you and I have something interesting to say to you and if you were interested in what I have to say then we start a conversation if you weren't interested then I just move on to someone else I thought it was a very interesting um, you know take on the whole follow for follow or the you know give and take aspect of building relationships on social media so what do you think yeah I think that's that's spot on I mean too many people Obsess about little de little little details uh, or facts about you know the ratio and all that stuff and 
reality is, if you're just getting started in 2015, you're late to the game, really late. Yeah. Do whatever you can to build up and catch up, right? So uh, you don't have the luxury right now. In my opinion, you, most people starting out now don't have the luxury to worry about that detail. Now, mm -hmm. I, I, I say that with a caveat of uh, that you want to also look natural, right? So don't fully automate too many things or don't, you know, if you have a high follow to, like your ratio, if it's off or whatnot, if you feel uncomfortable, back that up with more personalized or more human type tweets, right, or shares. Um, so you don't necessarily have to um, have to have to worry about that ratio as long as you add some human element somewhere, right? So it's like you go to this party and everyone's a bot, right? So who are you going to talk to? You still have to have real yeah. relationships and real conversations. Exactly. Right. So, um, you know, you just spoke about um, how people who are just starting out on social media marketing are, well, a little late to the game and, uh, you know, they need to catch up. So, um, you know, if you could uh, predict, you know, or, you know, if you could say what would be social media marketing in the next six months or, you know, what's hot for 2016 and if you could help us and our audience out in, you know, being better prepared for social media marketing, you know, what would you tell them? Yeah, so I think, um, I think the use of like media is going to be bigger in okay. in um, in 2016, and just in general, like it's going to get bigger. Uh, and what I mean by that is images, videos, audio bites, you know, what different forms of content, but still content nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, is going to get bigger and bigger. Um, I think authenticity is huge as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think people these days are so uh, used to kind of such high volume and these, you know, follower counts and, and kind of like they, they emphasize on the growth. Yes. Don't forget about um, don't forget about the authentic authenticity or your voice because that is ultimately the most important thing, um, and that's not going away. Um, the other thing is I see a lot of of Authority by um, by by association. What I, is by by that I mean like you don't have to be the content creator anymore. You can okay. be the content curator, right? So like mm -hmm. I could, if you were the person like on on social media that was just the shared the best content on healthcare um, or diabetes. It's just you know obscure topic, right? Like mm -hmm. diabetes is. If you're interested in diabetes, you you may have it, or you may just you know somebody has it. But but you're interested. You have finite amount of resources. But if you're the if you had a social media profiles like Facebook, Twitter, and even Instagram with helpful information, you're not you don't have to be the creator of that. You have to be the curator of that. Um, and if you just curated it right, you would be the go-to source for that. I would be trust you more than an individual site. And so don't forget about that power. And that's going even further and further. But um, I think the key with social media, and especially going forward, is to focus on things like certain topics and not to go too broad because everybody's going broad. Yeah. So, uh, you know, content curation, it's it's a fantastic idea. It does not take up a lot of time. I mean, you know, just you have to, it takes up a lot of time to, you know, to read and decide what's best for your audience. But obviously, not as much time as it takes for content creation. But you know, I'm, I guess that some, you know, people might be a little wary of promoting content which might belong to their rivals, uh, you know, rival brands or something like that. So I guess I don't know. Like you know, I guess they'd have to work around that. And um, yeah, so um, talking about uh, you know not creating content anymore and curating it instead, uh, there was one question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, what's your take on sponsored content? Um, you know, I think I think sponsored content, if done if done right or tastefully, um, mm -hmm. could could be okay. Um, mm -hmm. It could work. Uh, don't obviously not for SEO purposes or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, look at it, treat it as an advertisement. Um, but also, because you're giving so much, you know, you're you're getting so much real estate. Make sure you provide value, right? Um, so I treat it as a branding play more than anything else. Uh -huh. um, but I think, I think um, 
I, th I think most of the time people do it wrong, to be frank. Um, it's, it's usually too promotional or mm -hmm. there's too much emphasis around that one promote, uh, sponsored uh, content. Wh who does a really good job of this is BuzzFeed. Look at okay. what BuzzFeed does. Look yeah. at I would just study. Um, I think Neil Patel just recently published something re um, on his blog mm -hmm. uh, around like look dissecting like three of the most popular blogs. I think it was like Huffington Post, mm -hmm. BuzzFeed. I think it was Business Insider, right? So mm -hmm. study the big guys because they likely have figured out something you don't have the resources to figure out on your own or time. Um, and I just try to mirror or understand what they were doing and then try to like mirror one piece of that. So um, that's, I always kind of dissect um, companies and, and then try to figure out if that's right and then formulate my opinion and then if it, repeat if, it, if it's good. Right, right, right. Uh, I, you know, uh, now that I think of it, I never, I've read so many of BuzzFeed's articles that, uh, you know, they are, that are um, company specific, but then the way they package the, package the sponsored content, it's so beautiful that it doesn't come across as an ad and I just realized that, it, it's actually like fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You don't feel like it's an ad, right? It's like a exactly. value add. Yeah. Yeah. It's harder in the B two B space um, to do that, right? Because B two B is a little more critical. Um, if you run a, let's just say, blogging, uh, you 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 write about social media, and then all of a sudden you have a social media tool that's sponsored. Um, I think it comes across as unnatural, but like, let's just say in this situation. Mm -hmm. how, to do, how to do it where it comes across natural is mm -hmm. you force the people that are sponsoring the post to provide value. So let's just say um, I have a social media blog and a social media tool is sponsoring is writing a sponsored content. Well, what you should do is force that, force that tool to help write tips on how to, you know, on social media. And it's mm -hmm. just powered by this company. So it's still really educational and helpful instead of uh, it's an advertisement for this company. And most people are just not going to even read it, too. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're almost wrapping up over here. And I just have like, a couple of questions left for you. So, um, you know, talking about, we, we were just talking about how beautifully BuzzFeed packages its ads, right? And uh, mm -hmm. personally, I'm a huge fan of storytelling. And I actually do write story, you know, using stories for Crowdfire. And how important uh, is storytelling in content marketing? And how would you suggest, uh, you know, what would you tell people who want to include a bit of storytelling in their content marketing plan? I think storytelling, and I, I, I will one, I'm a big fan of storytelling as well. Uh, I think it's the, I think it adds the the personal touch mm -hmm. um, to a piece of content from making it this general advice or general thing I read on the web to, oh, that is written for me. Like, mm -hmm. I want, every time I write an article or publish a piece of content, I want people to feel, at the very least, this was written for me. I, I kind of sometimes write content for one person, mm -hmm. and that's my audience, right? So, but mm -hmm. I, want, I, want, I want to talk to, like, Bob, and I want to write a content for Bob. So I think being storytelling part of it, make, it, make, the, other, make the receiving party feel like it's written for them. And when I when I talk about story, storytelling doesn't have to be this like novel esque post. It could also be you can include elements of storytelling in a piece of content. What I mean by that is you can use examples of how you like if you're talking about a solution or problem or like tips, you can put a application uh, yourself as if like I did this and this would happen. Or I had this problem even or even other examples. Other examples. Um, you know, something like that. So I think that part really helps. Or sometimes I just say, oh, I know my readers often comment and say this, and I always appreciate that. And you know what I mean? Like I acknowledge the fact that I'm having communication. So it's almost like my my content, uh, my form of storytelling mm -hmm. and is, is almost conversational. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that adds... I want, you know, I think the best form of storytelling, in my opinion, is is um, is making feel, making people feel like they're having they they actually know know the per, the writer, right. um, uh, and so it, it could be something about your background, something experiencing now, and how you're solving it. It could be 
how you saw somebody else solving it or an influencer kind of in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, so a real life example, I think, is, is, is an easy plug. Okay, great. Thank you, Sujan. And um, this is my last question to you. So, um, if you were, um, you know, it's, it's a little funny, but uh, if you were a doctor of social media marketing or content marketing, what would be the three or five or you know how much how many ever step prescription that you would ask uh, you know that you would tell people to follow on a daily basis? Yeah. So for um, social media marketing. Yeah. 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 So I, I think uh, one is is to have a plan, right? To mm -hmm. um, to have a plan for at least a three to six month time frame, mm -hmm. um, and formulate the plan based off of what you've read. Um, advice you've gotten, um, research you've done, yeah. SEO, like your keywords and, and what you actually want to do. Uh, and also make sure your plan incorporates who your customers are and make sure you, you're talking about them. So first, I think the biggest mistake I see is that people don't have that right plan. Mm -hmm. They're just doing things and they read something like, oh, I'll just do that. Mm -hmm. You know what? Hold it. Like Make that plan and stick to it. Now, mm -hmm. step number two is adjust that plan. Your plan, mm -hmm. what you started, is probably going to change every month. So feel free to adjust it, but don't abandon it. Um, the the third thing is use um, talk to professionals. I think most people forget, or maybe they they don't approach it right. Mm -hmm. That if you email me and you said, hey, like, or not just me, any anybody really, any blogger, and um, and ask them like, hey, this is my situation. I've been blogging for X. I, I'm, my goal is this. What do you recommend? If you ask a very specific question, you're going to get answers. So don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask for help. Uh, but my recommendation is be specific. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want, if you have some money to pay, use mm -hmm. sites like Clarity.fm and actually just talk to people. I found that um, I found that most people will give you answers and and help you formulate that strategy as long as you're asking very specific questions. So, and then the next thing is do, right? Like, I feel like a lot of people always talk about what they can do or like, hey, I read this. What do you think? I'm thinking about doing this. Forget that. Stop thinking about doing stuff and actually take action. Mm -hmm. Most people, and myself included, again, I always used to do this and I find myself still doing this every once in a while. Um, uh, it, it's a lack of action, and a lot of times the action and the act of doing will tell you the answers you've been researching and looking for in the back end. Mm -hmm. And um, my last tip is do not, the world is full of takers. Be the giver. Give away, uh, and there's a quote from Zig Ziglar. I, I think it's, um, um, you, can have every, you can have everything you want, um, or I, I, I'm butchering the quote. I don't want to. I don't want to butcher it. But it's something around by giving by giving people what they want, you can get everything you want. And I believe that because um, because everyone else is doing the exact opposite. So um, be helpful and 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 like participate in the community. Uh, I can't tell you how much how um, important it is to participate in your community, wherever that is. If if again, even if it's a community of a specific niche like diabetes for for children. I mean, that's a unfortunately that's a that's a bad bad topic. But um, you know, if you're in that niche or in that category, know everybody in that space. They're going to help you. Great. Um, I think that's about it, Sujan. Thank you so much for taking our time and uh, you know being here. I have learned a lot, like a humongous lot, from you today. And uh, if there's anything else that you want to uh, say or you know talk about, maybe if you want, it, if there's anything else you want to say, you can go ahead and say it. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It's been it's been a pleasure. Um, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm having these dinners, and I want to kind of just use this last minute to talk about that. Sure. Uh, I'm going in around the world, pretty much everywhere I'm speaking or traveling to for work, and hosting a small dinner. Um, so check out growth.chat. That's the actual URL. Uh, and there's a little button, um, uh, like you, I, you asked earlier, are there any Slack groups? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I have one myself, so I'm happy to invite you. Um, just click on the Slack button on the website. And, um, All right. Yeah. All right, great. I will definitely join in, and uh, I hope 
others join in as well again thank you so much sujan and have a great day um, thank you yeah bye bye take care